It is Wednesday, October 12th, and we're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're in Genesis chapter 19 tonight, so I want to invite you to be turning with me to Genesis chapter 19. We'll be there in just a few moments. I want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning for Bible class at 9.30. We are studying through the book of Isaiah. Caleb has been doing a great job with that. I've enjoyed that class. And then at 1030, we'll be joining together for our weekly worship assembly. And as I always say every Wednesday, if you have any questions or concerns about what you see or hear in class tonight, any um, you know strange thoughts, objections to what you hear, I would love to hear from you. Uh, send me an email, fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, or give me a call or send a text message to 608-224-0274 and we would absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, thanks to all of you who helped us out by subscribing to the YouTube channel over the past several days. We are uh, aiming for 100 subscribers so that YouTube will allow us to create a custom name for the YouTube channel. Uh, we had 90 early on Sunday morning, so we were almost there. And by the time I'm recording this class midday on Wednesday, we are up to 99. So we may very well be at 100 by the time you see this tonight, but if not, or either way, uh, we would invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yeah, so instead of just a seemingly random string of letters and numbers, we will hopefully be able to uh, do something like Four Lakes Church, uh, as we've done on the other social media type accounts with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and so on. And that, of course, makes it a lot easier to share with others. Uh, especially in print, so like uh, visitor cards or in the bulletin, business cards, that kind of thing. But uh, thank you so much for your help with this. And even if we make it to 100, keep on going. And uh, that'll uh, that'll let YouTube know that uh, there are a few people here and there who uh, actually watch this channel. And uh, maybe it'll make it a little more likely to get out there. Well, tonight we get back to our study of Genesis. So the Book of Beginnings, written by Moses, at least primarily by Moses. We need to add that little disclaimer in there, uh, since there are a few few little passages here and there in the first five books of the Bible that probably were not written by him, but Moses in general is the author. Uh, we've been looking at the life of Abraham over the past several weeks. He's been promised a son, and last week we studied Genesis 18 where there were three men, and I put men in quotes in my mind and in my notes here, uh, because these three men visit Abraham and Sarah, and one of the men turns out to be the Lord himself. And he renews the promise, and he says that by this time next year, Sarah would have a son. Uh, even though I think Abraham is 99 years old, Sarah's around 90 at this point, Sarah laughs to herself when she overhears this from the doorway of the tent. And the Lord calls her out on it, but she denies it. And the Lord says, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> so kind of an interesting account last week. Uh, as these men leave, they decide to tell Abraham about their plans to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham basically bargains with God, uh, starting with 50 and then negotiating down to 10. So Abraham convinces the Lord not to destroy the cities if he can find only 10 righteous people in those cities. So that's where we ended Genesis chapter 18 last week with Abraham returning to his tent and the messengers continuing on towards Sodom. So this brings us to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19, and let's uh, start by looking at the first paragraph. We've been dividing this out by chunks or by paragraph. So this is verses 1 through 11 is the first chunk. Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 11. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground, and he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, No, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called out to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. 
Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, This one came in as an alien, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Well, in verse 1, we find that two of the three men are actually angels. Remember, the one man is actually the Lord. He's kind of still catching up with the group. He's there bargaining with Abraham. That's kind of how we left it again last week. And so these men appeared as uh, angels. They, they were men, but they appeared as men. So they were angels appearing as men. And I know just thinking about angels in the Bible, usually, I guess, in their natural state, we might say angels are uh, have been known to be completely terrifying in their appearance, even to the point where when they appear, uh, people fall down before them in worship. They are absolutely terrified. But here they appear in human form as they do on some other occasions. They come to visit Abraham undercover, uh, is how we might say that. And in the first few verses here, when they come to visit Lot, everything starts out pretty normal. So these angels appearing as men, they come to Sodom, they're checking things out, and they find Lot sitting in the gate of the city. Well, in the ancient world, the gate is sometimes where people would do business. It was almost like a farmer's market, we might say today. Uh, It was also something of a courtroom where the older men of the city would listen to cases, they would settle various disputes. Uh, I might compare this to the town square in an old town down south. Uh, Some of you know my grandfather preached in Lynchburg, Tennessee for 12 or 13 years. So we would go down there at least once a year and uh, visit them a lot of times for Christmas. And we would often walk with my grandfather from their house just a block or two down to the square. And um, I would often go down there with them. And, And one thing that was really cool to me was that the old guys of Lynchburg, Tennessee were often sitting out there in front of the courthouse on the square, and these old men were almost always whittling. So they all had pocket knives, and they were all whittling, and they would just sit there talking and whittling all day long. And as a kid from the Chicago area, I just thought that was the coolest thing ever, to see a bunch of old guys with knives whittling wood outside the courthouse. We didn't have that up north. And so they would just sit there all day long, talking to each other, fixing the problems of the world. And that's kind of the way I picture this, uh, the city gates in the ancient world. The old guys would sit there basically solving all the world's troubles. And what I really find interesting is that these angels find Lot, where? Sitting in the gate of Sodom. And if we were together, I think I would ask, what does that tell us? You know, what does that tell us about Lot? And what do we learn from the fact that Lot was sitting at the gate of the city? Well, to me at least, this seems to indicate that Lot is one of these men. He has been accepted among them, at least at this moment at the beginning of the chapter. So Lot, he fits in with these people. He's one of the crowd. He is there in the group. In 2 Peter 2, verse 7, Peter refers to righteous Lot, so there's some sense in which Lot is more righteous than the rest of the men in Sodom, but there's certainly also a sense in which Lot is a little bit too comfortable in Sodom. And we will see more of this as we move through the chapter. We've even seen some of this in this uh, first paragraph. But nevertheless, Lot sees the men coming. He bows down, treating them with respect. This is not a worship kind of thing, but he invites the men. And invites them to spend the night at his house. Well, the angels, of course, they've come to observe the city to see whether it's really as bad as they've heard. So they want to spend the night in the square. And so their goal is to, I think we would say, kind of camp out, camp out and uh, out in the open air. And personally, I'm picturing those men and women who sleep right on our sidewalks, downtown Madison. If you've been down there at late at night or early in the morning, most of you have seen this. Uh, men and women sleeping in the doorways of buildings along State Street, all around the Capitol Square. And obviously, it's not ideal. It's far from perfect. But I'm guessing that you might get a more accurate impression of Madison if you were to sleep on the square, as opposed to just popping in at noon and walking around here and there for a few minutes. You would get the full effect, wouldn't you, of Madison if you went there at night and spent the night downtown. So stuff happens at night, obviously. 
uh, that may not necessarily happen during the daylight hour. So the angels then, they want to stay on the square. They want the full effect. They really want to see what's going on here. Well, Lot, though, pretty much begs them not to do this. He urges them strongly. Just to note here, uh, Lot knows the city, doesn't he? He's been there not forever, but long enough to understand what goes on downtown. And ultimately, the angels listen to Lot's warning, and they decide to stay at Lot's house for the night. And Lot, like Abraham, uh, feeds these men and provides a way for their feet to be washed, and so on. Well, starting in verse seven or in verse four, uh, Lot's concerns are realized, aren't they? As the men of the city, both young and old, which is interesting, old and young men. Uh, very boldly surround his house and demand that Lot bring out the men so that they can have relations with them. And they are not asking, are they? They are demanding this. You know, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. So they are very demanding in this. So Lot then steps outside as a go-between. So he's out there basically, I would say, kind of on his front porch so he goes outside with the mob. He closes the door behind him. He tries reasoning with the crowd. And he's asking them not to act wickedly. So just asking is obviously not working at this point. So Lot offers this mob his virgin daughters instead. And I don't know about you, that it is absolutely repulsive, isn't it? We can hardly even imagine such a thing. So he offers up his daughters and he invites this angry mob to do with them, my daughters, whatever you like. Do whatever you want to do to them, but just leave my guest alone. And it's absolutely terrible. It's horrific. But his reasoning, in his own mind at least, is that these two men are his guests and he is responsible uh, for their safety. And obviously, I think we're thinking, well, his daughters are kind of his responsibility as well, right? And even more so as a father. They should be more important to him than these strangers. Uh, but for whatever reason, Lot offers his daughters to the mob instead of his two uh, male house guests. Well, the men of the city, though, they continue to demand that Lot bring out the men. And in fact, they accuse Lot of being uh, judgmental. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, you're judging us. You know, how dare you judge us? Um, does this not sound familiar uh, today? If we dare express any kind of concern over sin, um, aren't we also accused of judging? I mean, anyone who dares disagree is often accused of being intolerant, especially on a matter like this. And, uh, that seems to be exactly what happens here. Notice also how they talk about Lot being an alien. You know, the, uh, they were his best buds before when he was hanging out on the square. But as soon as he says something that they object to, you know, who do you think you are, newcomer? You know, you don't belong here kind of thing. And so um, as soon as he expresses this concern about wickedness, he is almost imme immediately attacked as an outsider. So the men of the city uh, threatened to treat Lot worse than his two guests. And uh, well, we can hardly imagine what that is. So... Uh, this is where it transitions to more of a riot, uh, to more of an attack. They press against Lot, so that it's getting physical now. They are pressing him up against the door of his home. And they intend to break down the door to the house. Right at this moment, though, the angels reach out and they grab Lot, bringing him inside, and they shut the door uh, at the last moment. They then strike the men in the mob with blindness. And the picture at the end of this paragraph is both sad and horrifying. The men of the city, although blind, are now frantically groping around trying to find the doorway, desperately trying to find a way to get in. I mean, you might imagine that sudden blindness may be kind of a clue that this is not going well. And that might cause them to reconsider what they're doing, but they continue. So they do not heed that warning. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 19, verses 12 through 22. The next paragraph, Genesis 19, verses 12 through 22. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city. Bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. 
When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains for the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small? That my life may be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zoar. Well, after rescuing Lot from the mob, the angels uh, assess the situation. They explain what they're about to do. They pretty much encourage Lot very strongly to get everybody together because we're leaving. And I do find it interesting that this is at least the third time that we read about the outcry of this city. In some sense, so the, the uh, sin of Sodom was crying out for God's justice. And these angels have been sent by the Lord with the mission of destroying the place. In verse 14, however, when Lot goes to warn his sons-in-law, they think he's joking. So, uh, what does that tell us about Lot? Well, there's a sense in which Lot uh, certainly might have been righteous to some extent. The Bible calls him righteous later on, I think, in the New Testament. But he was also perhaps known for maybe being pretty um, shallow. He wasn't the kind of guy that you took seriously. And so his sons-in-law, therefore, just dismissed the warning as not being legit. Like, yeah, right, whatever. So they didn't believe what he was saying. Well, in verse 15, we come to the next morning. It's time to go. So the angels give the last warning. Lot hesitates. And uh, the angels then take Lot and Mrs. Lot and their two daughters by the hand and practically drag them out of the city. So at this point, they almost don't have a choice. And... Uh, and once they're outside the city, the angels pretty much tell them to run for their lives and do not look back. So go, or else you will be swept away in the coming destruction. Uh, starting in verse 18, though, Lot argues with the angels. Um, I would point out he is respectful. Not quite as respectful as Abraham was at the end of the last chapter, but he is respectful. He's thankful for the warning. Thanks for what you're doing here. Uh, but he has this special request, and it seems that he's afraid he can't make it to the mountains. Maybe he's too old to travel. I can't be walking uphill that long. I'm not going to make it. Um, you know, we're, we aren't told the exact reason for this, but he asks to escape somewhere a bit closer to a small city by the name Small. That is the, the meaning of the name Zoar. And I kind of find it interesting that um, Lot is emphasizing the smallness of the town. And I know a lot of times we associate big cities with evil behavior, don't we? There's a lot of crime in big cities that you may not have necessarily in small towns. So a lot of that bias may go back many years. A lot of that is based in fact, isn't it? Um, I took a class at Freed Hardeman University under Dr. Earl Edwards called Urban Church Growth. And that's one of the things that uh, you come up against when you're trying to reach out to a large city. There's a lot of bias against cities. And yet... God loves big cities, doesn't he? Uh, Nineveh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Jerusalem, and Rome, and so on. God looks for people in these cities, and there are some good people in cities, so we just need to be aware of that, especially since uh, many of us do live in, in a big city. Um, anyway, so let me go to this other place instead. It's small. It's really small. Believe me, it's small kind of thing. So it's, it's not evil like the big city. It's small town. Let me go there. Well, one of the messengers grants the request. They will not destroy this small town that Lot has chosen. Um, this is above and beyond. It's a bit similar to the bargaining, as I said, that Abraham did at the end of chapter 18. The difference is Abraham was bargaining for others. Lot is bargaining for himself. Isn't that interesting? I think that tells us something about the difference between Lot and Abraham. Lot seems to be a little bit selfish. Uh, Abraham, on the other hand, is looking out for others. It was Abraham who went and rescued Lot from the kings who came in and uh, took him hostage. So Abraham is uh, very others-focused. 
All right, let's continue on to the next paragraph. Genesis 19, verses 23 uh, through 29. Genesis 19, 23 through 29. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. Well, as we look back at the first few verses here, I'm realizing that this is a bit different from the way I remember this reading it in the past, at least. Uh, in my mind, the destruction happens almost immediately, like grab you by the hand, you go, you leave, that kind of thing, like within seconds. Um, but unless I've missed something, it looks like Lot and his family flee overnight. And he's told to escape in the previous passage, probably in the very early hours of the morning. Now the sun comes up as he arrives in Zoar. And so they seem to have traveled maybe maybe several hours throughout the night. We're not told, but there's some distance involved here just to get away from the city itself. And once they get to Zoar, this agreed upon place of safety, the Lord rains down fire and brimstone, not just on Sodom and Gomorrah, but on the other cities in the valley as well. And everything there is destroyed and there's a lack of uh, any, anything uh, even growing. So it's not just human life, but plant life as well. Uh, kind of the sad footnote here is that Lot's wife looks back and uh, she is turned into a pillar of salt. So she is told to get up and uh and flee and and go and and leave and not look back but she does look back and uh, this this tragic thing happens well jesus of course refers to this with reference to the final judgment and the destruction of the earth uh, this is over this little uh passage in the in the box there this is luke 17 28 through 33 this is where jesus says it was the same as happened in the days of lot they were eating they were drinking they were buying they were selling they were planting they were building but on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. So I'm just saying Jesus uses the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah to try to illustrate what will happen at the second coming. It'll be sudden, it will be unexpected, but we can prepare for it by just always being ready. And the encouragement is, remember Lot's wife. I would say a favorite memory verse of Bible students everywhere. Very easy, very short verse, like Jesus wept, but remember Lot's wife. Uh, makes us remember everything that happens back in Genesis 19. So obviously Lot's wife disobeyed uh, by looking when she was forbidden from looking. Might have even gone back. to uh, The way Jesus words it here might not just have been a casual look over the shoulder, but she might have actually kind of turned and said, forget it, you know, I'm going back to my stuff, that kind of thing. We don't know, but that's the way Jesus seems to present it here. Uh, but she did disobey. So, you know, what's going on in her man, mind? You know, what is she thinking? I, I, we're not told explicitly, but I'm thinking it's rather safe to assume that this woman was looking back rather longingly at her former home. You know, she's living in one of the most evil places on the face of this earth, and she's missing it. You know, I can't I can't leave. So longing for that former way of life. Remember, Lot chose the land that he did for financial reasons. So Mrs. Lot apparently impacted by that, and maybe she's missing the stuff. And so the warning from Jesus to us is, remember Lot's wife. In other words, don't do that. Don't do what she did. So once we make the decision to follow Jesus, we prepare for his second coming by not looking back as this woman did. Uh, by the way, some have suggested that Sodom and Gomorrah were located in what is now the southern end of the Dead Sea. Uh, this is an image provided by NASA, taken by the uh, crew of Space Shuttle Columbia back in 1989, and just focusing in on the southern end of the Dead Sea. So a lot of the Dead Sea is pretty deep, but the southern end is not really deep at all. 
And so if this is what we're looking at, it's almost as if God just kind of took his thumb and just pushed that, that southern area even further down into the earth and maybe some of that water drained down into there. I mean, obviously there's a lot of salt in that area due to the uh, evaporation that takes place. The Dead Sea is basically the end of the Jordan River. No outlet. The water just evaporates in the desert heat and just leaves the salt and those other minerals behind. But I'm just saying that this is one theory as to the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're at what is now the southern end or a southern tip of the Dead Sea. Uh, getting back to Genesis 19, though, starting in verse 27, we have Abraham getting up early in the morning. And I, I read an interesting article earlier today about uh, Abraham being a morning person. Um, I like getting up early in the morning, and uh, Abraham apparently did as well. And it's going to be another early rising event for Abraham in a few chapters here when he goes to sacrifice Isaac. He gets up early, as I remember it. But he gets up early, he notices smoke rising in the distance like the smoke of a furnace, and it is coming from the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The conclusion is that God remembered Abraham through this, and uh, he rescued Lot from the destruction of those cities. And God rescued Lot, not necessarily because Lot was so awesome, but God seems to have rescued Lot for Abraham's sake. So God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Also, let's, let's ask, how many righteous people did Abraham think God might be able to find in Sodom? Remember the final number? What did, what did Abraham finally get down to? Where did he leave it? Ten, right? If you find ten righteous people, okay, I won't destroy it. How many did God actually find? Four? Maybe? Four at the most? I mean, the daughters have some serious issues that we're going to find out about in the next paragraph. Uh, Mrs. Lot is a great big maybe, isn't she? Is she righteous or was she dragged? I don't know. It's kind of, I'm leaning toward getting dragged. And Lot just barely makes it out himself. He also having to be dragged out of the city. So how many righteous people were found? Let's just say not 10, a whole lot less than 10. But nevertheless, Lot does make it out with his two daughters. Uh, let's conclude tonight with Genesis 19 verses 30 through 38. Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar, and he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. On the following day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay with, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. As for the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Well, up in verse 30, we find Lot is too scared to stay in Zoar, so he moves further up into the mountains. Personally, I'm wondering what he's scared of. But it's not too hard to imagine that he's a bit nervous, that word will get out, that he's responsible for what happened here. After all, if several cities are destroyed and you're the only guy who gets a heads up, and uh, leaves just in the nick of time and everybody's dead but you. Um, word might get out that you might have had something to do with it. Maybe. Okay, so Lot keeps on going. He ends up living in a cave in the mountains. Um, I would just make a brief note here that this is the first reference to a caveman in the Bible. And I'm just saying sometimes archaeologists today will find drawings in a cave, won't they? or maybe primitive tools in the back of a cave somewhere, and they will make a huge deal about, you know, prehistoric man grunting with his club and, and, uh, and on and on. You know, this is evidence that men once lived in caves and now we have evolved and must have been previous, you know, uh, lower life forms and that kind of thing. Um, however, let's just note that we do have written evidence right here in Genesis 19 of people living in caves. This is not some strange thing. In fact, we still have people living in caves today. 
Um, if you want to, you can call a real estate agent and they will find you a cave to live in. <laughs> if this is your kind of thing, uh, you can find a cave today with satellite, cable TV, whatever. And so I'm just saying, just because we have somebody living in a cave doesn't mean that this person evolved from some primitive life form. A lot was literally a caveman. Okay, in the rest of this chapter, we start to see what kind of father Lot really is. And this is messed up. It's just messed up in all kinds of ways. I mean, it's almost like they get him back for offering them to an angry mob of homosexual rapists. Right? That's what happened earlier in this chapter. And now, okay, we're going to show him. We're going to do this. Uh, in verse 31, the firstborn talks to her younger sister about the fact they don't have any men around. That may be kind of an exaggeration. Uh, it may not be quite as dire as they are saying. Obviously, they don't have to uh, resort to this. Um, but they are living in the middle of nowhere in a cave. So let's get dad drunk and let's have kids with dad. And we'll just be one big happy family out here living in our cave with our little cave babies. And this is what they do. Okay, One at a time, one night, then the next. And this is now, I believe, the second negative reference to wine or alcohol in the Bible. Uh, do you remember the first negative reference? The first negative reference was back in Genesis 9. As Noah and his family get off the ark, Noah plants a vineyard. He eventually makes wine, gets drunk, gets naked. His son Ham tells his brothers in a way that is apparently inappropriate, kind of snickering. Look what dad got himself into kind of thing. They cover up their dad uh, as they should have done, as Ham should have done. And... Um, and Noah eventually curses Ham for doing what he did. Well, there's some positive references to wine in the Bible, but there are so many more negative examples and a, a number of very serious warnings about drunkenness. So this is now the second of those negative examples. And uh, these two women get their dad drunk, they have relations with their own father, and they both uh, get pregnant. And I would also note there is some sense in which Lot goes along with this. Okay, he was tricked, right? And his decision-making was compromised due to the wine that he drank, but he ultimately uh, went along with this, at least in those early stages with the drinking and, and heading in that direction. Okay, in the last two verses of Genesis 19, we've got the results of this. The firstborn gives birth to uh, Moab, the father of the Moabites, and the younger gives birth to Ben-Ami, the father of of the Ammonites. In terms of practical applications, I hope we at least consider the possibility that Lot is now reaping what he has sown. I think you reap what you sow. That, that's a pretty good, I think, practical application of this chapter. There's a general rule in scripture that we reap what we sow. Over in Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8, Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Well, how did Lot end up in this situation? I think we might agree that it goes back to Lot choosing the best land back in Genesis 13. That's what when uh, Lot gave his young nephew, uh, when Abraham gave his younger nephew Lot the choice of the land. And remember, Lot took the good land and left the desert for his old uncle. So he pitched his tents as far as Sodom, and that's where we learned for the first time way back then that the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked before the Lord. So knowing this, Lot was enticed by that well-watered land. So money, right? I want to make sure I get my, stock, my uh, livestock fed and all my crops are watered and all that. And so he came out ahead financially in the short term, but he paid a price for it spiritually and even physically, losing almost everything, losing his wife. Uh, barely making it out alive with his messed up daughters. And then what happens next in the end of this chapter? So we reap what we sow. That's the first thing that we need to consider. Before we wrap this up for the night, I would also just note that there is a growing movement in the religious world, even among a number of people in the Lord's Church, to redefine the sin of Sodom away from homosexuality and toward the sin of not helping the poor. And you think, what? wait a minute, what in the world are you talking about? Um, years later, God will condemn his own people in Jerusalem through the prophet Ezekiel, and he'll make a comparison. He says in Ezekiel 16, 49, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. Okay? So some have taken this passage out of context and they've concluded that the real sin of Sodom 
was not homosexuality, but it was a lack of hospitality. And they then explain away the men wanting to have sex with other men by saying that the real problem was that they wanted to do this without permission. So they'll argue um, that the homosexuality wasn't the issue, but that the rape aspect of it was the real problem. Okay, and I've heard that a number of times over the past 20 years or so, and a lot more over the last several years. But there are a few issues with this theory we need to be aware of, though. If we go back to Ezekiel 16, the next verse, verse 50, says this. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me, therefore I removed them when I saw it. Okay, so many false doctrines can be contradicted if we just read the verse like before and after that was taken out of context. And that's what we do here. So always read the, the verses before and after if somebody quotes something that makes you say, what in the world is that about? Okay, so th we have a reference to abominations, plural, taking place in Sodom. We can also consider the remote context, other passages that may refer to this. Jeremiah 23, 14, where God again uses Sodom and Gomorrah as a very negative example and describes their sins as horrible. Uh, he describes their sins as adultery, walking in falsehood, calling what they were doing both evil and wicked. You see several sins mentioned there, don't we? Uh, and then in the New Testament, we have Jude verse 7, where Jude says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Okay, so before we just dismiss Genesis 19 as, you know, not having anything to do with consensual homosexuality, we need to ask, which sins were the people of Sodom and Gomorrah guilty of committing? Was it ignoring the poor while living lives of luxury, as Ezekiel points out? Was it homosexuality, like Moses refers to here in Genesis 19? Was it lying? Uh, was it wickedness in general? Was it arrogance? You know, I would suggest all of the above. I think that'd be the most ac we can't, accurate thing to say. We can't narrow it down to one and exclude all the others. So I just want us to be aware of this uh, so that it doesn't catch us off guard, especially since some, even in the Lord's Church, seem to be using Ezekiel 16 uh, to try to dismiss Genesis 19 as having anything to say about homosexuality. In, re in reality, uh, one sin often has a way of leading to another. We can be guilty of many things before the Lord. And I would also remind us that uh, homosexuality is not the only sin in this life. Although, by the way some people talk about it, it may seem like it because that's all they focus on. Um, in fact, though, Jesus says in Matthew 11, 23 through 24, that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment, as opposed to those who reject Jesus and his message. So as bad as it was in Sodom, it is worse to reject Jesus. Let's be clear on that. And in fact, Jesus says if Sodom had seen the miracles which were seen in Capernaum, the residents of Sodom would have repented. And that is amazing to me. And it's that kind of talk that got Jesus crucified, comparing his listeners to Sodomites, the residents of Sodom, saying they were better than you are. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I know it's been a, an interesting chapter. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day, 930 for class, 1030 for worship. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for explaining what really happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And thank you for the reminder that when we turn to you in faith, we are not to turn back to a life of sin. We pray that we would have the courage to warn the world around us about the judgment that's coming for all of us if we ignore the many warnings in Scripture that this earth and everything in it will someday be destroyed by fire. Father, please be merciful to us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus, we come to you by his name. Amen.